morning and welcome to the fourth uh, session of our Clean Energy Conference. We're delighted to be um, joined by an incredible panel of experts um, and an incredible audience of consumer advocates uh, from around the world. And what better time to be doing it uh, than the day after World Consumer Rights Day. Every 15th of March, um, consumer advocates from around the world unite to highlight the most pressing global issue facing uh, consumers. And this year, the membership of Consumers International, that's 200 consumer groups in 100 countries, selected empowering consumers through clean energy transitions as our global theme. So on Monday, we heard um, from how consumer protection and empowerment uh, can be a catalyst for the energy transition. And we launched our white paper, um, which I'd encourage you all to read and we'll post it in the chat, uh, looking at a global level. On Tuesday, we heard from businesses uh, in mature markets on how they're innovating to empower consumers. And on Wednesday, World Consumer Rights Day itself, uh, we heard from leaders about how to secure affordability and security alongside sustainability uh, in the transition. And today, uh, it's my favorite session, and I'm really excited about this. We're looking at the question of energy access. 775 million people around the world live without access to electricity up 20 million uh, from 2021, according to the International Energy Agency. And under today's policies, they project that 660 million people will still live without access to electricity in 2030, and 85% of those will be living in sub-Saharan Africa. Today, we'll be asking, how can we leverage the power of consumers as actors in the marketplace with both rights and responsibilities uh, to meet this challenge? So the next few minutes, I'll introduce our brilliant panel uh, before sharing a few words on why we're looking at this at all from a consumer rights lens, and then we'll dive straight in. So first on our panel, and I believe that she's having trouble joining, um, but hopefully she'll be able to join soon, is Rosemary Mpofu, who is the Executive Director of the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. She's also on the Board and Council of Consumers International, and she leads the council's team across its uh, projects and advocacy. She was also appointed a consumer protection commissioner in Zimbabwe uh, and works closely with the commission to ensure the implementation of their Consumer Protection Act, which in fact the council themselves drafted and campaigned tirelessly to introduce finally in 2019. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Rose, hopefully when she joins, um, about the consumer experience in Zimbabwe and how the new technologies, solutions, and business models really look like from the perspective of those they're supposed to serve. We're thrilled also to be joined by Juan Carlos Itzaguire, who is Senior Financial Sector Specialist uh, at the consultative group to assist the poor, CGAP. CGAP's a financial inclusion think tank, uh, House of the World Bank, uh, that we're very proud to work with on a range of issues from digital finance um, to energy. Uh, and he works on digital finance supervision and financial consumer protection focused on consumer outcomes. He has over 20 years uh, financial sector regulatory experience, uh, and he co-founded the World Bank's global program on financial consumer protection. Uh, so we couldn't have a, a better expert on board than him. Jones Ntaukura is co-founder and managing director of Zua Energy, um, which is a last mile asset financing company in Malawi on a mission to end energy poverty. And since 2016, Zua has been pioneering le leading brand in solar pay-as-you-go uh, in Malawi and neighboring countries. And Jones comes to this panel with uh, 12 years of experience spanning international development, consultancy, manufacturing, uh, and I'm thrilled to have him on board as someone who really knows back to front the consumers he's serving uh, and the barriers that they face. Jenny Corey Smith, uh, welcome. Jenny is Chief of Programs at CLASP, the Collaborative Labeling and Appliance Standards Program, which is a brilliant organization that drives efforts to mitigate climate change and expand energy access uh, through appliance energy performance and quality. Uh, and is a topic really uh, close to the heart of consumer advocates. And Jenny comes to this uh, with a decade of experience in energy efficiency, market transformation projects around the world. And at CLASP, she ensures that they're climate and clean energy access programs are effective and contribute to the vision that we all believe in for people and planet. And finally, Yatunde Fadei, 
founder of Renewable Energy and Environment Sustainability Initiative Africa or RIS Africa. Um, Yatunde, I think we met at COP27 uh, in November and of the many conversations I had then, uh, the one I had with you really stuck in my mind. Uh, and no wonder, looking at your CV, you are a serial entrepreneur, advocate, practitioner. Uh, you founded Reese Africa, uh, which is a youth-led NGO providing renewable energy access uh, in the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. Uh, and you're currently building Vector Energy, a fintech and clean tech solution aiming to fundamentally change how the world uses power. Uh, Yatunde is a US tech woman scholar, one young world scholar, and nominee for community action for the Future Africa Awards. So looking forward to coming to you for your practical experience, but also your experience advocating for the voice of younger consumers um, at the most the highest international levels. Uh, and Christine Singer is program director of the Shine campaign. And I'm thrilled to have you, Christine, because I'll be leaning on you throughout the session for your uh, more than 30 years of experience looking at these issues and focusing on the intersection of public uh, and private finance. At the Shine campaign, Christine, you lead the effort to accelerate uh, new funding to energy access at the last mile, uh, and interestingly looking at women and community-led initiatives. Um, so looking forward to hearing from you on that. If you could bring the slides down, please, Chloe. Um, and I'll say a few words about uh, why we're looking at this as consumer advocates. Energy access um, means a lot of things um, to different people. Throughout the week, uh, we've looked at the themes that we hear again and again and in the energy sector, uh, but from a new angle, and that's one of consumer rights. And we campaigned, Consumers International campaigned uh, for the UN guidelines on consumer protection uh, and for the 11 legitimate needs of consumers, which have been adopted uh, by all UN member states. The first and most fundamental is about access to basic surfaces, so that's energy. But the rights also encompass things like protection against hazards to safety and health, the promotion of sustainable consumption, the protection of consumers' economic interests, adequate information, data protection, the availability of redress. And so for us as consumer advocates, purely binary metrics for energy access are really not good enough. For example, is having an electricity line into your home the same as being able to turn on uh, lights or appliances without worrying if it's affordable um, or if it's really meeting your needs or if it's good quality? So for us, looking at the whole range of consumer rights or consumer legitimate needs, energy access is a very complex topic uh, and one that you have to look at in the round. But it's also about consumer empowerment as well as rights. We're all actors in the marketplace and we all have a power through our purchase decisions uh, to change that marketplace. But we face barriers, real barriers, financial, regulatory, infrastructural, which is preventing us from leveraging this power. So today's discussion, we're not gonna focus on specific technologies, but we're gonna focus on the models uh, of removing those barriers and empowering consumers uh, to uh, remove those barriers and gain clean energy access. And we'll be zooming into two uh, brilliant case studies. Uh, one is pay-as-you-go financing and one is community access. Um, and we'll be talking about those in a second. But first I wanted to think with our panelists about what those barriers are and set the scene. So Yatunde, from your work in Nigeria, in Ghana, you've worked with and for communities to expand energy access. What for you are the main barriers that they face in the moment that you're trying to remove? Yatunde. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, to answer your question, I would first like to create some sort of um, platform to ensure everyone understands the kind of um, target audience that we deal with, right? Uh, but before then, let me just quickly say thank you, um, express my gratitude for the opportunity to, you know, share um, my experience. So first, this just basically envisage um, a place where there is no access to electricity for about a century, and these people are essentially so marginalized that they cannot afford 
three squared meals. So if they cannot, if they are in extreme poverty, right, they rarely would be able to afford access services and this is the kind of communities that we deal um, with now to the barriers access to finance is a huge barrier for um for the energy services that they aim or they want typically and this essentially further marginalizes them because they are uh they are they are in communities where that have been ravaged by rural urban migration they are essentially communities that have been forgotten in the middle of nowhere. So just because they are not profitable to developers or to the government, because ultimately there's supposed to be a cost-benefit analysis when um, implementing infrastructure as this, um, just because they do not have that capacity, you know, to pay for this energy services, they should not be excluded. They are also still consumers, yeah. right? So um, access to finance is... Can I interrupt you there? Just because there's uh, quite a bit of background noise on your end. Um, but I think we've heard... Uh, if you could mute yourself now, um, and our team will help you remove that noise. But we hear you loud and clear that affordability and cost is a huge barrier, but also that you don't just look at the individual, but at the communities that they live in, the place that they live in, uh, the special barriers facing rural communities, for example. So thanks so much for that perspective. Jones, briefly, do you agree um, from the customers you're serving in Malawi, uh, what do you see as the main barriers? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. So I agree with, uh, with you today. Uh, she's right. I, I think I also want to add that one of the challenges that we uh, also are trying to you know help our customers with is uh, just general information and awareness because there's a lot of uh, um, products as well that are not uh, that are either counterfeit or you know different quality uh, not certified products and they are normally cheaper than the product that we sell so we are also facing a challenge where we have to you know continuously educate customers so that they see uh, the difference between what a good product is and what a bad product is. So uh, awareness uh, is something that I can add to what you can already say. Brilliant. So we've got affordability, market availability. We've got uh, an understanding uh, the situation of communities and we've got awareness and education. I think that's a really brilliant platform for us to have this discussion. Before we dive into our first case study, um, I wanted to think about the clean of the clean energy conference um, because we've started this session with people's needs and their rights but there's another thread through this week which is um, the climate emergency we're facing uh, the fact that the energy sector globally represents three quarters of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions so that was the big climate transition picture uh, that we uh, painted in yesterday's session Christine, I want to come to you. Uh, when we're looking at this issue uh, of energy access um, and last mile energy access for the 8% of the global population that don't have it at the moment, what's the climate rationale here? What, how does this fit into the big climate picture? Christine. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Oliver, and I appreciate the invitation to, to join this esteemed panel today and good to see some, some folks I know and to meet some new folks uh, in this conversation. I think the climate situation is, is clear in the sense that the, the types of uh, energy options, the traditional energy options of kerosene or candles or batteries or diesel that are being used in many of the unelectrified areas are, are bad both for the climate, climate and for people's health. And I think what's important to realize is that we have the technology solutions available uh, to substitute for that. And there's been a good bit of work that's been done that really looks at what are those climate benefits when you displace kerosene, when you displace, and, and I'm sure uh, Yatende can talk to the massive diesel usage in, in Nigeria uh, and the opportunities for replacing that diesel and the impact on climate. It's, it's, it's an order of magnitude tons of carbon displacement. I don't have the number at the tip of my finger, but I can find it. Um, it's, it's incredible the opportunities to use the technologies we have, 
which, which we'll hear be from some of our other panels, Jones in particular, can be delivered on a cost-effective basis. So you get the benefit of the development benefits that accrue from decentralized renewable energy. You get the economic development and gender benefits, which I'll address later, from using those technologies. And then you also get sig the significant carbon displacement. And the reality is if we're able to move customers now, we're, all, we're offsetting those future emissions. Uh, so instead of you know, waiting till the grid comes, uh, which perhaps one day it will, um, but it's many, many years out, why do, why do these customers, these consumers need to wait? We can offer that environmentally superior technology now. And as we've just talked about, we can do it in a way that's affordable and accessible to the majority of, of the, the rural populations. Thank you, Christine. And what a great kind of clarion call to action uh, for our audience of consumer advocates. Why wait um, when the technologies are available now? Speaking of consumer advocates, I believe that Christopher, um, you've joined representing Rose who couldn't join us at the last minute. So thank you so much, Christopher, uh, for stepping in from the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. We're talking about the barriers faced by consumers for energy access. We've talked about affordability. Uh, we've talked about awareness. In 30 seconds, uh, what would you add to that list? Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting. Um, for most developing countries, so if a country like uh, our Zimbabwe, uh, access to energy remains um, a concerning challenge. I think, um, uh, and uh, I, I believe that grassroots innovation then presents a valid solution uh, to this uh, to this challenge. So there's also the issue of price. It is very expensive for households maybe to purchase clean energy equipment like solar, which um, I think is one of the major impediment uh, to, to, to achieve um, uh, clean energy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. Um... And thank you all of you for setting the scene notes so nicely. We've got two brilliant case studies that we're gonna zoom into uh, today. And the first one is pay-as-you-go solar, um, which really has for some reason been years been revolutionizing the way uh, solar equipment in particular is, is bought, uh, addressing that key barrier that Christopher just mentioned of affordability. And between 2015 and 2020, uh, around 8 million people in sub-Saharan Africa gained energy access with pay as you go models. Um, I want to go straight to you, Juan Carlos, our expert on this. CGAP has undertaken a range of uh, research on this topic, so no one better to share with us. What is this solution? How does it work? What are the opportunities for consumers? Um, and what are the key risks they face when engaging in pay as you go solutions? Over to you, Juan Carlos. Thank you very much, Oliver. And thanks overall to Consumers International for inviting me to join this very important panel today. And I'm very glad to have the chance to talk a bit more about this very promising uh, solution uh, around PECO solar financing. Uh, and what we have seen, it's really a very significant progress in making energy services affordable to low-income consumers uh, using new type of technology that help both consumers and providers. And I'll first start to share some uh, findings from consumer research that CGAP helped carry out a few years ago in four countries where we talk with consumers to identify why they appreciated these new type of solutions. The findings were people valued access to more reliable, cleaner, and safer energy sources through this new uh, type of business model. Customers were willing to increase energy expenditure and even change, adjust their own household budgeting decisions to accommodate the acquisition of a device because they really value their having that type of device in their lives. They also appreciated flexibility 
in their repayment arrangements, which goes back to the point around affordability and price that we just talked about in a few minutes ago. Because the flexibility in repayment brought expensive assets within the reach of the household. Through these repayment arrangements, a few possibilities were, were brought to the table. Frequent, a small value and remote payments that allowed consumers pay based on their own income flow. So if there were times where they have access to $50 of income and then other times where they could only get $10, they could still afford to pay based on that in unstable and unfrequent type of income. That was a great possibility for consumers to be able to pay based on their income flow. Also, the options to test the quality of the system before committing to the entire purchase price of the equipment. Also, in case of a 12-month loan contract, prepayments and discounts for early repayment could be incorporated into the payment plan. And finally, remote lockout technology enable companies to monetize, collateralize, and monitor assets in harder to reach areas. And consumers were able to not only have access in remote areas, but also in a way control their energy usage over time. Now, it's not all positive. It's not all opportunities. There are also challenges and risks. In terms of challenges, ensuring that the cost of the solar equipment remains affordable, both from the provider side and for the customer side, so that it's sustainable. From the provider side, making sure that they have adequate credit risk management practices. And there's a whole set of tools and indicators that CCAB, IFC, and other colleagues have developed on this front, because it's, it's really about credit risk management from some guys some cases, providers that were not fully attuned to the importance of all these uh, practices. Also, understanding better the right balance of price, repayment periods, and costs that work for customers. And it also make the business decision uh, sustainable. In terms of risks for consumers, which is another important point, is product risk of buying a defective or low quality equipment or asset. And then the financial risk, because consumers can be vulnerable to the risk of a financial shock that can make them their future payments unaffordable and make even risk their loss of a non-refundable deposit or potentially returning to darkness. So a key response by the industry to address these types of consumer risks has been raising the importance of consumer protection from the outset. And the Global Association for Off-Grid Solar Energy, GOGLA, actually really made consumer protection a key pillar of development. And they developed a consumer protection code with six very important principles. First, transparency, with focus on providing clear, sufficient, and timely information before, during, and after sales on the product, service, payment plan, and data privacy practices so that consumers could make informed decisions. Second, responsible sales and practices, whereby the company ensures consumers' characteristics are considered in the price, payment structure, and fees of the service, so that consumers can afford to pay for the product without becoming overburdened. Third, good consumer service, including technical and after sales service support, accessible, effective, and timely mechanism for complaints and problem resolution, as well as adequate instructions from product usage, disposal, as well as health and safety risks. Fourth is good product quality, whereby the company shall ensure that product and systems are appropriate, good quality, safe, and that they perform as advertised, and that the user interface 
and payment platform are appropriate for consumers and that reasonable measures are taken to ensure product longevity. Fifth is data privacy, so that company follows good practices and complies with relevant data privacy regulatory frameworks, and that the company, an important point, only collects, uses, retains, and shares that personal information that is necessary to provide the service to the consumers, not more than that. And that there is a legitimate, legitimate interest of the business while keeping consumer data secure and confidential. And last but not least, the principle of fair and respectful treatment of current and prospective customers with adequate safeguards in place against abusive treatment in the promotion of inclusive and non-discriminatory practices, as well as the gathering of consumer views and feedback for the design and delivery of product. So, and final point, it's worth highlighting that in addition to the code, Google took, is taking actually steps to assess how companies perform against this code of conduct. And having a self-assessment tool and including, which I think is very important, a lean data consumer survey so that consumers are asked about their experience with the product. And therefore the company can be measured vis-a-vis -vis the customer outcomes on how responsible the providers are. So SIGAP really is embracing the importance of having a responsible ecosystem where industry providers and the consumer voice is elevated so that together can, we can all help ensure that these solutions that are provided to consumers are really taking into account the value and the responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the customers. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos, for that brilliant introduction to the issue, to the opportunities, uh, some of the risks. I want to go straight to you, Jones. You've built a company uh, putting this solution into practice. You're one of the leaders in the solution uh, in Malawi. You're also on the board of Gogla, um, the voice of the off-grid solar energy industry that has created this uh, consumer protection code. And uh, Christine, you're also uh, an independent member of a Gogla, so we've got great representation here to really uh, to get to the heart of this issue. Jones, how is Zero Energy empowering protecting consumers um, using the Gogla code? What are the impacts uh, that you've seen from this consumer protection by design approach? Um, so when um, Carl was, uh, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was speaking, I just picked Quite a number of ways that he was uh, he was mentioning he, things like affordability, flexibility, uh, remote areas, uh, price sensitivity, credit risk. I also want to add one another way, which is uh, illiteracy. So this just in these words, they are just you know giving you a picture of the kind of market that we are we are operating in. So we we, we operate in markets where uh, all these things are very are very uh, uh, applicable. Just to give you a snapshot. Of, uh, of how where of, of how uh, where Zua is right now, uh, fifty one percent of our customers are actually below the poverty line. This is like uh, as of today, you know, eighty five percent of our customers have no any access to another alternative. So it's either they buy solar or they stay uh, with the uh, status quo. Eighty five percent. That's uh, that's quite high. 79% of our customers are actually first time users. So they are buying or using solar for the very first time. They have never used it, 79%. And 83% uh, of our customers, of course, they do report that their life has improved after using solar, at least for the first, for the first uh, 12 months. So I'm giving this number just to show you, uh, uh, again, the kind of environment that we operate. So we, we, we are dealing with customers that are very high risk, low income, but we still have to give them a product in a way that it should be affordable and uh, we should be flexible as well in terms of how they are paying it. So it's not very easy to do, but uh, 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 I think it's something that when, I think for us, we have been very committed to making it work. And um, uh, we are seeing the results now of the power of having, you know, uh, of actually driving those efforts from the same consumer because they are the ones who are telling us what, what they want. And we basically, 
develop a model that responds to those needs in such a way that we can be as flexible, we can also be as planning sensitive uh, 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 as possible. So the Gogla um, consumer court, as, uh, as uh, already you know, explained, has got six, you know, uh, six uh, uh, principles. And um, before, so there are two, there are, I think, three ways on how companies can use the uh, this code. Of course, the first one is that you have to uh, to make a commitment uh, that you want to use it as a company. So Azure, we are one of the first companies that we actually endorsed uh, the uh, this code. So committing ourselves that we are going to you know measure ourselves against these uh, international uh, uh, sort of industry uh, standards. The second thing is you have to do a, a voluntary self assessment. Okay, so for your own company, you have to assess yourself. Uh, so on the transparency principle, there are different indicators that are asked or that have been set up. So you basically have to answer yourself uh, based on, on how you're doing on that, on each principle. And it gives you a score uh, on how you're doing. Uh, then the third part is, uh, of course, you have to do now a third party uh, assessment. So someone neutral has to come and actually uh, uh, assess you. So I'll give you examples of two, two scenarios. So the first scenario is when we were not using the Google uh, uh, code. So we we had different different problems, but I think based on our on our business and our model, the biggest mistake that you can make is to sell products to customers who can't afford, and that is very very common uh, in the in the industry. So uh, we had probably about maybe fifty five percent at our lowest in twenty twenty, about fifty five percent. Uh, collection rate. So collection rate is the basically we are saying how many, how much money are we uh, are we collecting from the customers every month? Because it's a pay go, it's a loan. We are, we are giving someone a credit so that they can pay over uh, twenty months. So every month we have to calculate. Okay, this month how much money are we expecting and how much money have we actually uh, are collected? So we are doing about fifty five percent. We didn't know what was wrong at that time. Uh, we just thought, okay, it's really hard to do this uh, micro, you know, micro loan or micro credit uh, asset financing. Um, Twenty-seven percent of our customers at that time were reporting that uh, uh, they had problems with our products, and these are problems that you know can actually easily be 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 uh, resolved. So it could be a problem like I'm failing to make a payment, uh, or or I'm failing to get in touch with uh, with, uh, with with an agent or something like that. And 66% uh, of those customers actually said that they were not being uh, helped in good time. So that was basically creating or giving us problems in terms of we are trying to support this kind of customer segment that is really hard to, to support. And then we're also having all the challenges whereby we are failing to collect the money and customers are complaining that we're not helping them in, in good time. It's a very bad story to even take an investor and say we need money to support this business because you know uh, with those rates, it's, it's really hard. So we had also 80% of the challenges that were, were reported were actually to do with payments. So payment challenges, either, you know, maybe the network is down or I'm failing, I don't know how to pay, I don't know what my account number is, things that we took for granted because we know they have a contract, they can just go there, but customers are different. They want you to, you know, uh, treat them differently. Um, so um, we started using the Google code in 2020. In 2021 was our biggest in terms of actually, you know, implementing it, doing the assessment, and then you know, using it. But since we started using uh, Google code, so some of the things that we we have done really well, for example, I would I would just go quickly by the each uh, each principle like transparency. So we basically said, okay, I think we're not very clear even in terms of. Uh, uh, teaching customers what to expect and what not to expect. So there were issues whereby customer or some of our agents, our sales agents when selling, they would probably over promise, oh, this product can do so much or can do A, B, C, D when the product can only do uh, so much. So we started to say, okay, we need to make sure that we are very transparent as possible by making sure that all the information is given to customers. So uh, we started putting uh, stickers on the batteries to just tell people, for example, how to make a payment. Uh, through through particular channel, we added different payment channels. We also started to accept payments. Uh, for example, uh, normally when a customer has missed a payment, you say they are in default, and uh, you have, you have to move to the next round, or they have to pay a fixed amount. We change that and say, okay, you can pay any amount, any day, as long as within the month you have made your monthly payment, and that actually triggered payments. Like customers were now free to actually 
make payment as the money is coming because before they were under pressure to pay five dollars per month you know in, in one go but when then we said okay you can pay one dollar every every week as long as you are paying five dollars within a month and that changed the game um in terms of responsible uh, sales for example again very very critical thing we actually have a, a a mantra that we use for our sales agents when we're training them and we tell them you your you, your job is to protect the customer okay so what we mean by protect the customer we mean do not sell products to someone to a customer who you think is not going to be able to afford before they'll just sell to anyone because they don't get a commission so that that's how they make money but now we said no protect the customer avoid over financing and if you do that we are also going to uh, uh, uh to make sure that you are uh responsible for that so the way we pay the agents our commission we changed before we are paying them 100 commission upfront they, they make a sale in store they get the commission now we pay them, uh, uh, I think, 70% of the commission upfront. 30%, we keep it. We keep it for six months because we want to see how the customer is going to uh, perform for the first six months. That's critical. And if the customer is not is not having any problem the first four or five months, we know that the agent made a sale to a good customer. So that that uh, that uh, psychology of protect the customer is now you know uh, stay with the uh, with the customers. Uh, just just to, uh, since uh, since 2021, by the end of uh, 2022, we had already seen a lot of you know uh, improvements. So, for example, uh, our collection rates moved from you know 55 percent to about 90 percent as of December uh, 2022. Incredible change, but these changes are coming by just a small a small a small adjustment in terms of how we are getting payments but also intensifying in uh, education and make sure that it's as transparent as possible so the customer knows what they're paying there's no any hidden costs they are aware that i'm paying this or this i'm paying that for that so everything is very very uh, uh transparent we've seen our net promoter score now coming to about 75 percent so a lot of our customers that we are our sales that we are making now are actually coming from referrals so we've got people who actually you know, uh, recommending Zua that you buy products from Zua. Actually, yesterday, one of my colleagues sent me a screenshot from a WhatsApp group where uh, some random people were chatting, and then uh, someone was actually saying, oh, you need to go to Zua and buy this. So it was very, I took that share to my uh, to my company uh, company group. Everyone was happy to say, oh, yeah, this is really good. But you, when you get more customers referring to you because you are treating them well, I think that's how we can actually achieve this. So we are achieving these things by making the products affordable, making the pricing uh, flexible to a customer segment that is really, really hard to sell to. Thank you so much, Jones. What I really love about the way you've set that out is that consumer protection for your Zua is not a barrier to growth, but it's the key to securing the growth that you have. It's not something that you have to do because you feel pressure to do it, um, although of course there's a need for accountability. It's because you see that as key to, to growing your business. Uh, Christine, I want to come to you for reactions, uh, comments, um, thoughts on this. Uh, thank you, and, and one I want to applaud uh, Jones and Zua's work that they've done. They've really taken this in as a principle and have institutionalized it in their company operations. And I think that's a really important part uh, and it also has really jettisoned Zua to one of the leaders in terms of uh, the, the payments that they've been able to achieve by implementing this type of, um, you know, it's two sides to the coin. On the one side, it's being protecting the consumers and all of the things Jones has just said. And then it's putting in place within the company, the value proposition and the credit management systems, the credit screening systems that enables his company to actually implement that so it's a it's both it's driven by where, where i my other comment is it's driven by the fact that investors are now looking for this because if you don't have customers who are paying either because they don't like the product it's not working or they've actually been sold good they can't afford you're not making your payment terms as as joan said they started at 55 percent repayment rate no one's going to invest in a company with a 55 percent repayment rate so it's, it behooves the companies to really focus on the consumer because of all the reasons we've discussed and also because that's what their investors are looking for. And many of the investors, and this will come later on as well, 
whether you're looking at development finance institutions, you're looking at impact investors, they're really now driven in this PAYGO space in, in seeing how the company is implementing those GOGLA consumer protection principles. I believe for many of them, it is a requirement and the company needs to actually demonstrate because there's been experience within the sector when those aren't followed, the ability for the company to really re get repayments from their, their customers and grow their market is rather limited. So, you know, two comments, it's, it's definitely in the best interest of the consumer, but it is in the best interest of the company as well and is in their, in their ability to grow and retain new capital for growth to show that they respect and honor their customer and treat them according to those principles, particularly uh, transparency and, and follow on quality service. Thanks, Christina. I think that's really speaks to what we um, shared in our white paper, which is you have to look across the whole consumer journey. And the nice thing about pay-as-you-go models, despite some of the real and serious risks that Juan Carlos mentioned, one of the nice things is that you know the customer will only pay if the system works. So there is that um, incentive from the business side to ensure a really strong after-sales service and support. And it was great to hear um, from you, Jones, about how you're doing that. I want to give Juan Carlos uh, a chance to come back first. And perhaps Jones talked about the different segments of consumers or customers that they're serving and that they're able to identify through the surveying uh, that they do. There's one segment. We know that energy poverty uh, disproportionately affects women and girls in poor households. What do you see as the specific barriers that they face um, and the specific opportunities when it comes to engaging in pay as you go? Juan Carlos. Yes, this is an important point because in many cases, it, at the beginning, we identified challenges that women were facing in terms of access and usage of uh, energy. And one of the challenges we observed at the beginning of this process was that men was at the top of the decision of the acquisition of some of these products. And the budget allocated for household issues therefore was reduced for women so that they would not be able to do other stuff uh, because the, at the household level, the decision were primarily taken by men. Uh, now, what the industry has been moving a bit better is in terms of identifying women as potential new users and potential uh, leaders in terms of the actual use of the products and the technology is helping identifying and separating men's usage with women's usage, which is an important development that needs to be done so that really technology can help women take full ownership of the usage of energy within the household and take the decision around this. But there are still challenges in terms of, for example, who really owns the cell phone, the mobile phone, and if the ecosystem within a country is not yet allowing full women's ownership of the actual mobile device, then it's, it can be a, a challenge still. It, it varies depending on the country environment, but I think this is an important obstacle that needs to be addressed to help women really fully empower the decision-making within the household. Thanks for that. And I think, yes, looking at the systemic barriers there, um, it's not something that one company can uh, remove on their own. But Jones, I want to come to you anyway for uh, thoughts on how you are empowering women and girls in particular with this. Uh, but also, I wanted to, and so we can wrap up our discussion of this case study, uh, imagine that you are being challenged by an angry consumer advocate who is saying, well, the whole business model of pay as you go is centered on uh, remote lockouts. And even if you have transparency, strong after sales service, uh, uh, great customer engagement, at the end of the day, um, you're putting that fundamental consumer right at risk by the very design of this uh, business model. What would you say to an angry consumer advocate that comes to you with that? You're on mute. 
So oh, thank you. Uh, that's a that's a very uh, interesting one. So I'll, I'll start with the first one where you're talking about how we are empowering uh, women and girls. So one of the things that we we've been like trying really hard to do, uh, we are still you know uh, working progress to actually achieve that. But uh, our board actually uh, you know challenged me and my team that we need to have you know uh, at any given level 60% of our you know core staff should be women and 40% should be men and the main reason is that what uh, I was saying like we're trying to the women are the the the, the main users and beneficiaries of uh, of these products in the in the villages they are the ones who are doing all the cooking uh, 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 in a candle using a candle to cook they are all the they are the ones who are you know taking care of the of the you know, little babies at night so they are the ones who really need to use uh, to use these products so if we can get as many women and young girls in this space as much as we can then we are actually creating mentors or oh, these, these are people who can actually speak directly with the women's uh, challenges and be able to make uh, to make sales. So, for example, right now we're doing more work around uh, recruiting uh, many female agents because they're the ones who are actually, you know, the last mile uh, 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 face of the company who are meeting the, the customers. So we'd like to have as many female uh, agents as possible because they can speak with their fellow women and be able to to, to make sales or convince them why solar is uh, is good. Uh, when it comes to the second uh, part of um, you know, an angry consumer who thinks that, you know, this uh, this model probably is uh, also hinges on the rights. Uh, I think for us, the biggest, the biggest uh, issues or the, best, the biggest opportunity that the model presents is that it's making a product that is rather expensive, but also inaccessible. We are making it accessible. So in most areas where we are getting these products to, these are areas where uh, I can speak for Malawi. Uh, these are areas whereby in the next 20 years, even the grid is never going to go there for two reasons. One, it's very remote. Two, for the grid to go there, it's very, very expensive. They're not going to put power lines, transformers, just to go and power, you know, 10, 10, 10 households. This is how we live in Africa. We don't, our, 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 the way we live is not very linear where you can bring a power line and, you know, we live in, uh, in a, in a, in a, in isolation. So you find there's a village, uh, uh, just maybe 10 households, that's one village, most of the close family and friends, uh, sorry, mainly family. And then you have to walk another, maybe another one kilometer, another maybe smaller village there. It's very difficult. And these people are also very illiterate sometimes. And it's very hard for them to know which product is good or which deal is better. So we are taking the burden of bringing these products very, very close to them. So most of the people actually, they have the money to be able to buy these products, but they don't know where to buy it. Either because they're very far from people who can sell the product, but also they lack the knowledge. So I think for us, we are really trying to make the products accessible by bringing them closer to the people, but also making it as you know as affordable as possible. And I think that should be uh, uploaded. The other part of whereby we're doing the remote locking, it's really to drive the payment because at the end of the day, we are business. People also have to uh, have to pay. It's 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 a, the, the, the same as, as like a loan. We have seen microfinance institutions when you fail to make a payment, they come and uh, and remove all the from your roof. Now they have stopped because they have learned that that is a bad way of doing things. We don't do that. So the remote locking for us gives us you know uh, confidence that we are going to be able to 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 get the, uh, uh, the the money. But also these people over time they are building their own credit. Uh, 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 did as well. Thanks so much for responding to that and congratulations uh, on your success in promoting gender equality in and through your work. Um, let's park the discussion of pairs to go. Can I just add one, Oliver, just go ahead. one quick thing to reinforce that. And, and I mentioned it before, it really, the company has to implement credit screening because that protects yeah the customer to ensure that they can pay it. So when the consumer advocate comes, Jones should just take that advocate and show them the process by which they assess whether that customer can pay. That's a, such an important protection, if you will, because you don't want a loan to a customer who can't pay. It's bad for the company and it's very bad for the, for the consumer. So I just wanted to emphasize that again, that that's part of how you, you, know, you, you respond. You say, look, this is what we do to make sure our customers can pay. Brilliant. And finally, can I go to Chris as our consumer advocate on the panel? 
credit screening as a form of consumer protection uh, in this case study reaction to that? Christopher, are you still with us? Oh, thank you so much. Now, what I think is, uh, I think it's, uh, this is a very great intervention. Um, but I, what we have done um, on our part is that uh, we have used a, sort of a program where we are, since we are a membership organization, and uh, our members are dotted throughout the country. We have used a, a sort of a revolving fund as well. So we have consumers who usually come together. Um, I mean, sort of a concept whereby members contribute equal amounts of money and uh, on a revolving basis with each member availed um, and agreed. Christopher, can I pause you here? Yeah. Can I pause you there? I want to come on to your um, incredible model of uh, collective purchasing that you've innovated at the Consumer Council in just a second. Um, but since we're just wrapping up our discussion of pay as you go solar, and it's been really challenging, it's changed how I view it, um, certainly. I saw you, Tunde, you had your hand up, and I do want to give you a chance uh, to comment on that issue first. I know you've been having connection difficulties, but you, Tunde, um, your comment on the, the model that we've just been presented on pay as you go. Okay, um, sorry, I'm having serious connection issues. Um, That's okay. So I just wanted to um, comment on the back of what Christine said as regarding credit scores, basically credit scoring. And, you know, um, earlier in the discussion, I mentioned that this type of consumers are very peculiar. Right, they don't have access to finance. They are not financially banked. They are financially excluded. So there is, there is typically no way for them to build that credit score. Even their local um, financial um, financiers, right, like the national associations, cannot even guarantee their credit score. So um, it's it, what, what this demands is some sort of innovative but inclusive uh, um, way that we could essentially bring these people on board or probably just you know give them the benefit of doubt or use innovative uh, uh, um, financing mechanisms like grants in which there is no um, need to you know get the money back so to speak or um, ensure that they compulsorily make payments because in having to um, ensure that there's access to finance or like what we are doing, we partner with a mobile money agent and financial institutions to help them build that credit score. But that's on the first, um, that's the first time, right? So we also go out there to look for grant um, donors, so to speak, that will allow us to co-produce co with the communities that do not ex exactly dictate what we should do for the communities, but allow the communities to you know, dictate what they want. And then we use the grant as a sort of capital, um, ex towards the capital expenditure, and then the communities can pay for the operational expenditure of the uh, projects and the installation. Thanks so much, Ajinde. Uh, and thank you, Christopher, too. I think you've both given us a great transition uh, into the next part of the discussion, which is we've been thinking about individuals, um, but we're also in communities and there are things that we can do together uh, that we can't do apart. Um, so the next solution we're going to look at is really kind of community access schemes, community-led grassroots solutions, um, those that use local contextual traditional knowledge. Um, and this requires a whole different set of tools uh, and innovations as Yutunde uh, just shared um, to adopt. So, First, I want to go back to you, Christopher. Um, the Consumer Council, you've done incredible work bringing together, especially women, into consumer clubs um, so that they can collectively purchase solar equipment. I'd love uh, if you can keep it to less than five minutes. What is the model uh, that you've created? How is it benefiting consumers? And what's the impact that you've achieved so far? Over to you, Christopher. Well, thank you so much. 
So I think, um, like I was saying, um, this model, um, it's sort of a court, sort of a cooperative concept uh, where we use our consumer agent action clubs uh, to contribute equal amounts of money and uh, on a revolving basis. Mm -hmm. So each member is availed um, because they used to do this and they used to buy each other groceries at the end of the year. And then instead of buying groceries, we said, no, why don't they, this, uh, this year, why don't they um, uh, put their funds in a pond and then uh, they can be able then to buy uh, solar equipment? Um, because also in our country, we're having um, quite energy challenges. You see um, it's people who are on the grid right now, um, electricity is no longer as stable as it as it used to be. Uh, we usually use the hydro from um, our lake, and um, uh, uh, from Wanke there there's uh, there's coal. But um, you see, there are always uh, challenges with those issues. So we were trying then to empower consumers to say they, if they can take energy issues into their own hands. So like we, we have regularly used this concept to transform the lives of many women, um, especially around the area of informed buying during the times of hyper um, uh, inflation. So in this case, the role of Consumer Council of Zimbabwe will be to facilitate consumer access uh, to affordable equipment from different uh, inverted suppliers of uh, uh, of solar equipment, and also we have engaged financial institutions to facilitate the handling of the revolving fund, uh, so that um, it becomes very easy uh, for all parties. So we have consumers on one hand, and we have service providers on the other hand, and then we have also the financial institutions playing a role. So I think um, we have um, had women, it, it, the program has actually attracted a lot of interest uh, from uh, consumers ac across the country um, because of the energy challenges that uh, uh, the country is facing. Uh, uh, made statements that no, they might then have to, uh, if, 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 if the energy challenges persist, they might have to remove consumers from the national grid. So I think this is uh, uh, actually uh, then uh, making consumers to want to, uh, uh, to be involved in this. And this is the first stage because uh, you realize that we are also targeting uh, the rural households, but mainly now it will be biogas. Um, so this is the first stage and many women, um, some have already started to save uh, and um, we believe that uh, uh, before the end of the year, maybe in August, we have uh, quite a lot of women, the first set of women who are going then to receive their equipment. This is, we are also working with the regulator because we believe they've got the technical expertise and also uh, leaders in terms of the um, the tried and tested service providers because they work with them on a regular basis and uh, they, they also regulate the, the space and the market. So we are working with the regulators, uh, the Zera, in terms of who, which the service providers to work with. Um, and um, I have to say that one of the issues that we have realized or that we have observed is that solar equipment especially the genuine one, it's not, um, it's, it's, it's expensive. It's really expensive. That's the reason why um, consumers have to come up with uh, uh, these interventions so that uh, they can save and actually then be able to uh, eradicate energy poverty. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the solution, especially since it's something that's growing uh, and good luck to you in growing it out. What I really love about it is that not only is it empowering consumers collectively, bottom up, if you like, but you're engaging in a really multi-stakeholder way with the energy regulator Zara, with uh, vetted suppliers, um, with financial institutions. Um, I think that's a really interesting lesson for anyone uh, in the audience who's thinking about innovating in this sort of way. That you need to have that multi-stakeholder um, participation. Can I come to you, Yatunde? Um, 
we've only got a few minutes left uh, to talk about this, but I'd love to hear from you um, on the projects that you've implemented with and for communities in, uh, in your country, in Nigeria and in Ghana. What has been the best way to secure their buy-in and continued participation in decision-making processes? Okay, thank you very much, Oliver. So, um, like I mentioned, what we do with these communities is co-produce, co-produce the solution to um, the priority um, issues that we've um, encountered or we've observed and researched, right? And we do this through, like you mentioned, multi-stakeholder engagement, um, where we see the... Um, the recipients as a major, in fact, the most important stakeholder within this engagement. And this is because they are the ones that would live with the solution even and continue to sustain the solution even when we are not there anymore. And this also bothers on education too. We do a lot of not just community engagement, but capacity building with um, um, these communities. And we do this because we want them to be a part of the decision. We want them to be, you know, included, right? And if they have, if they are equipped with the right education, particularly with the youths and women, then they can continue ca to carry the solution on. And I would give an example of um, um, a set of communities, uh, four communities that we did in Kagako local government, which is typically in um, Kaduna State, Northern Nigeria. Um, very remote, very remote communities, abandoned, out of reach, and um, when we were consolidating on the right um, approach, um, because we could produce with them, we identified um, the needs, including water and sanitation um, needs, um, electricity needs, you know, and they were the ones that said, let us, you know, um, let us do a community-based um, electricity model, not um, solar lamps, not uh, um, individual systems, but we want a situation where if anything goes wrong with the system or with the project, everyone feels the burn. And that is, you know, a way to continually, you know, ensure that, you know, it, it works and it's continually maintained, right? And we ended up de um, developing a solar microgrid based on their recommendation. And what is solar microgrid is, is like a, a baby <laughs> status of a, a, a mini grid, right? We could not develop a mini grid for them because we knew through our survey, through, you know, different mixed methods, um, we knew that they only earn, earned about $14 per month, right? So if they are already giving out half of that, even more to satisfy their, um, their energy needs, kerosene, you know, and all of that, then we have to deploy a solution that would cost them at least 15% of, so that they can, you know, be able to use the monies, their revenues per month to do other things and, you know, push them out of abject poverty. So um, within this decision-making, we realized that since they are the ones dictating for us, we needed to find um, a donor that could essentially help us with the capital expenditure um, and they would continue to manage the, the operational expenditure. So typically they pay $2 per month to continually maintain. So this caters for not just the operations as far, you know, maintaining the system, but also pays the youth that clean the solar panels that, you know, um, help with administrative work, like collection of the fees, right? Um, and because they were so involved with the decision-making, the revenue leakage is really low coupled with the fact that we, we, we brought in um, a, a financial um, institution, basically um, mobile money agent, to open accounts for all of the households. So they have like a unique a customer, unique identifier, uh, identifier that you know, essentially helps us to collect the monies. And also we opened the bank account, a major bank account for the community. So the monies that is within the community is not just to even pay the staff, but to also upgrade um, the communities. And um, because they were involved in the decision making, they, the, the kind of solution that they propagated was um, um, of productive use, right? It wasn't just, um, you know, um, just lighting um, bulbs or charge phones. They are actively using it to develop um, their uh, um, trade, 
you know, and then for the youths too, because they are also involved, they started to take interest in solar um, um, training programs because we taught them how to, you know, we basically charted a new course career as opposed to just farming or hunting, right? And we have about three youths from these communities now deploying solutions outside of their community, like in mega in a mega city like Lagos um, in Nigeria. So this is what essentially happens when decision making is not just you know localized but you know the people that you are developing these solutions for feel included and can also contribute to that decision thanks and and your final comment is a really nice transition because through the kind of power of your model you've inspired others uh, to go and replicate it uh, and that's really what we want to end this session looking at how do we scale these uh, amazing solutions that we've heard about. Christine, uh, I want to come to you. A lot of this discussion has been about money, um, predictably. Uh, we've heard, uh, we started with the consumer and their need for finance. Um, and we've heard from different uh, practitioners, from Zua Energy, uh, from Yatunde, from Christopher. And in each of their cases, they're sort of acting as aggregators uh, for that need. We're coming to you uh, from the other end of the uh, of the chain, if you like, uh, capital supply, the Shine campaign um, is connecting development development agencies, anti-poverty organizations and others um, uh, to provide finance. How can we connect all those pieces up um, and what types of money do we need uh, to make this work and scale? Over to you. Great, Great. thank you. Well, I'm just going to start that by saying we need all colors of money on the table to make this work. We heard about investment money going into Zua. We heard from Yatende the, the fact of donors who can be responsive. Christopher talked about it's really a blending model that I heard from his presentation. Um, and before I address your question correctly, I just want to say, we always talk about scale, but to scale, what we need to do is replicate the three business models we've heard today. And by adapting those and replicating those throughout other markets, that's how we get to scale. So I just, when we talk about scale, it's not just one model that takes off, but really the aggregation based on what's happening in particular countries of these types of models and others out there. But I do want to uh, applaud all three of, of uh, those speakers, Jones, Christopher, and, and Yatende on the innovativeness and ability of those models to deliver. Speaking about the capital journey, if you will, um, the fact is we do need all types of capital to make this work. We need grants. Uh, we need grants going into programs, like Yutende said. We need grants to de-risk uh, funds that are going into the types of business models that Pago is, is offering or biogas systems are offering. And, and so we need to look at what's worked and how those models have come together, those blended capital models. We also need to realize that there is a push towards large scale renewables, large scale decarbonization. Um, and while the consumer is in those models, they're not as prevalent in the thinking, in my opinion, as they are in the models we're seeing at the community-based level or at the off-grid level. And I, I had an opportunity to listen to a panel recently that took place at the Barraza in South Africa last year. And there was a statement in there that I think, Oliver, comes through in your white paper, but kind of connects all of your four sessions this week, which is that there's a global South problem in the global North. And really addressing this issue of access to electricity, affordability, transparency of information that we've just talked about here, I am pretty sure also got discussed in some of the sessions earlier this week that you've had. And so what's interesting about how we use capital is the challenges are very similar in both the North and the South in some ways in terms of ensuring electricity access. And we need to look at how blended capital finance structures are working in the North as well as how they're working in the South. And, and so that's part of, I think, the the cross-sectoral learning that has to take place. There does need to be a, a, an advocacy role in some into the development finance institutions. 
into the multilateral development banks and some of the large climate funds that are being established or expanded because the capital isn't flowing into this type of work that we're talking about. Uh, at the Gogla conference back in October in, in Kigali, where Zua was showcased as, as one of the leaders in their credit management and, and repayments, um, we learned that there is a not, not just a stagnation of capital moving into this space, all colors of money, grants, debt, and equity, but also a decline. And that that decline is particularly prevalent, prevalent to local companies such as Zua and local projects such as we've heard in, in Zimbabwe and Nigeria, because the capital is flowing into big emissions reductions. So what this means is all of us need to make the case on the consumer, on the right that, no, that we leave no one behind on the electricity journey, and that there is a need to bring capital down to community-based activities, down to um, ag smaller aggregators of projects such as we've heard and companies such as we've heard. And so there is an advocacy requirement that we leave no one behind. Uh, I also think that there is a good bit of attention now, and, and this was also mentioned about productive use, and Jenny, I'm sure, will come to this in, in her discussion about appliances. But there is an, you know, we talk about the importance of first time household access, and Jones made the comment of the large number of his customers who have never had access to electricity before. That's significant. And that is a requirement that this body of work should do and that funders should invest in. At the same time, how do we ensure that capital is flowing to economic activities of the consumers to enable them to use electricity, not just for lighting or phone charging, which are important, but also then for small scale appliance usage that enables them to create an income. So capital needs to look at all of those elements as it moves down into the, if you will, down the continuum into the more off-grid rural types of areas. So I think there's an advocacy element here by consumer groups that they need capital. I think we also need to acknowledge um, that some end user subsidies will be necessary and that at the national level to really ensure uh, electricity access for all and we leave no one behind, that national governments will need to step up and look at how they use subsidies and public money to enable all of the, their constituents to receive funding and make sure those consumer protections are built in all the way down the, the, the delivery model. It's how, the, it's how basically we've de developed and delivered electricity in the North and it should be very acceptable to deliver it in the South. But I do want to uh, close by saying many of the challenges that are being faced in, in the communities represented here today are what we're seeing in other countries uh, in the North and bringing them together. I, I applaud you, you, the Consumers International in giving us this opportunity to see how do we learn from one to the other? How do, is what being done in Europe around subsidies? How can that be applied to some of the learnings that we're having in in um, Africa and elsewhere. Um, but the development finance institutions and the MDBs need to step up, they need to be innovative, and they need to take bigger risks with the capital that they have on hand. Thanks, Christine. I'm really glad that you mentioned the diagonal that we're trying to draw between Global South and Global North. And we've got an audience here of consumer advocates from the African continent, but also from the Middle East, uh, from Europe, uh, from Latin America, from the US. Uh, so this is a global audience and, uh, and it's a really important um, encouragement that you've given us to make that advocacy point about leaving nobody behind, um, which is just as important or comes hand in hand uh, with the big climate transition goals. Jenny, um, thanks for waiting patiently there. Um, you're representing CLASP, uh, which is really, um, serving at the center of these efforts to uh, reach these goals through appliance energy performance and quality. And as I said, this is a dear to the hearts of many consumer advocates. We've heard from these three brilliant solutions, how they're removing barriers to access uh, to these key pieces of equipment and appliance. But from you, we'd love to hear 
what yeah. governments support and Christine mentioned this uh, a little bit what government support is needed uh, to widen access to these appliances and to ensure that they're safe uh, efficient um, and protect consumers along their journey over to you Jenny Thanks, Oliver, and thanks to all the other panelists and everybody who's joined. It's been so wonderful to see consumer advocates from all over the world as you chimed in from where you are uh, and what organizations you represent. Um, you move forward to actually let's skip to slide three. Yeah, to the next, get this one, great. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, there's been a, a lot of really great discussion around, you know, affordability, some of the challenges there, challenges around availability, consumer awareness. And we recognize that, you know, consumers, it, they're faced with a lot of decisions and we need some sort of policies, we need standards in place to create, you know, sort of a floor, right? So that when consumers are going to purchase an off-grid solar solution or, um, you know, or an, or an appliance, you know, maybe for the first time, they just got, got connected from the grid and aren't, you know, sure, you know, what, what all they can, can, all the things they should consider, aside from obviously like the sticker price that they see up front, that there are other considerations that there's a real role for, for governments and for standards bodies to step in and create uniform standards that all companies, you know, manufacturers have to comply with um, to really protect the consumers and, 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 um, you know, Take, take away the guesswork and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, go to consumer to consumer and try to talk to them about the importance of quality, the importance of energy efficiency, but, you know, it's much more efficient and, and we believe in the, in the end better for the consumers if there's, you know, some, some standard that's, that's agreed upon and that consumer and consumer advocates have input in um, that sort of sets that floor. Um, so at, at CLASP, we, um, we support governments and uh, and and other other entities that are developing standards, developing performance um, measures, and 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 quality assurance frameworks for um, appliances and equipment. And we do believe that consumers really are a critical stakeholder in the design of these. And there are three key uh, policies that that we work on: um, minimum energy performance standards, consumer-facing labels, and um, quality assurance standards. And and uh, yeah, we believe that you know all of these are critical, but really for this this audience that we're talking to and on the off grid sector, um, quality assurance standards, and in particular, um, uh, Barisol, which is which is uh, uh, a certification program, I'll talk a little bit more about, is really critical to growing this market in a in a sustainable way that protects consumers. Next slide. Um, and then this is just to show, you know, back to the affordability question that, um, you know, efficient appliances, they aren't just better for the planet, they are also better for consumers. And this is particularly true when we're looking at off-grid solar solutions and working in, in these markets where affordability is a top constraint. And this chart shows the difference in the cost of an old off-grid solar system package with either an efficient or an inefficient fan. And you, you can see that the, the system with the more efficient fan is significantly less expensive because even if uh, the more efficient fan, you know, that may, may be more expensive, but you need a, a smaller and less expensive solar panel and battery to power that fan. Um, next slide, please. Uh, it talked about the, you know, the Google Consumer Code and the importance of, of quality and, and standards and quality assurance and that, and, and this really does deliver a better, uh, a better user experience. Um, and this is just a chart from a, a a uh, study that we did recently that where we, where we spoke to over 4,000 um, Kenyan households. And we found that for all solar products, um, you know, looking at both uh, lanterns as well as solar home systems that can, you know, patter, power small appliances, that quality assured systems provided a, a better consumer experience and broke less often. In the case of solar home systems, which are the most expensive of these three product types, the failure rate of a non-quality -qual verified products um, tripled over those that were quality verified. Um, next slide, please. And this is just digging a little bit more into that and thinking also about cost of repair and the importance of warranties um, and, and quality verified products are much more likely to have warranties. Um, and if a product has a warranty, then obviously, you know, that that's an important consumer protection 
uh, piece, but also reduces the price of a repair, right? So we're not just looking at, you know, these monthly payments that consumers have to make, the, the upfront costs, but also, you know, there's maintenance associated with, with these products as well. And it's not like, um, I guess, the, those that are connected to the grid and they call the utility company if there's, there's an issue, right? It's, it's on the consumer and the company that, that sold them that product to, to make sure that the, the product performs well. Um, and so when we look at the, the actual cost of repair, you know, really like the, those products that have a warranty are, I mean, it's pretty intuitive, right? That they're much, much less expensive to, to repair. But um, again, the data just shows that it's uh, significant, significantly less, um, less cost for the, the repair of these products that actually, you know, come with a warranty and are quality verified. The next slide. Um, and I'd just like to close now just with a few, just to share a few examples and, and opportunities where we continue to engage consumers as we aim to increase the adoption of, of energy efficient appliances and get those energy services to the, to the consumers and to the end users. Um, so the first is consumer awareness campaigns. This is to raise the awareness of, you know, energy labels, quality, quality markers, and also um, the importance of just generally of quality and efficiency um, and of solar solutions. For example, you know, understanding the, the benefits of, of solar solutions uh, versus kerosene, diesel powered solutions uh, and why, why consumers should choose those and, and um, you know, how they can go about you know, getting, purchasing them, getting them repaired, et cetera. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, uh, earlier about the work on, on lean data and listening, listening to consumers. And um, that's something we really believe in is to try to collect and aggregate data on usability and consumer experience. And, and um, within the programs that we run, for example, we run results-based financing required by the, by, the, by the funders to verify that the consumer actually purchased that product. Um, but we try not to do that as a bare minimum, but actually go beyond and ask them about, you know, the experience, um, what are the impacts of these products, are they still working, and then share that information back to the companies that sold, sold the products, but then also aggregate that data and make it um, publicly available as, as, a, as a good to understand, you know, some of these thorny issues around over indebtedness, but also the impacts. Um, Engaging consumer advocates in the policy development process is, is critical. And we realize that for many countries, this you know, requires some capacity building and, 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 um, and education that, you know, to, give, to give the consumer advocates the information that they need um, to, to understand these issues because it, is, it can be you know, very technical when we're talking about ISO and IEC standards. And, uh, and so you know, trying to be that bridge and provide that information to these, to these entities. Um, uh, for example, in Indonesia, we've created a multi-stakeholder forum that includes consumer organizations, techn technology experts, business associates, and NG NGOs that are working on um, uh, advocating and trying to develop consensus-based standards for um, cooling products like air conditioning. Uh, and on the last point, just also uh, noting that private sector, you know, the companies, and we've heard from, from um, some of the companies here today, uh, that they're, they're critical to engage and to, to engage with. They're often, you know, the, they're the ones that interface directly with the consumers, the retailers, distributors, and manufacturers. And so in any campaigns that we've run, we've always aimed to engage with manufacturers and align on messaging and promotional materials. And you can see some examples here from um, Ghana and, in, and Indonesia uh, of working with them to, to um, promote energy efficiency to consumers. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Jenny. I want to come back to you um, with one question that's come up in the chat and the Q&A function a couple of times, uh, and Christine mentioned it, and it's about government subsidies. Uh, so we've had a question from Felicia in Nigeria uh, and from David, I believe, in Peru uh, around subsidies. What do you think, and we've already heard on the panel from Christopher about how the best quality assured products that you were talking about are the more expensive ones. Uh, so how do we ensure that those ones become affordable and what do you think is the role of government subsidies in that? Um, yes, I mean, I think there definitely do need to be subsidies, you know, especially when we're looking at the more expensive equipment already. When we look at the data of who's who are purchasing these solar powered appliances, they do tend to be, you know, relatively well, you know, well to do 
well-to-do households, right? Um, we know that even, you know, there's many families that can't even afford a solar lantern, right? That let alone a solar powered pump or a solar powered ref refrigerator, that's just not within reach. So if we really want to reach the, you know, the hardest to reach, there definitely needs to be subsidies. And I think that uh, there is um, growing consensus and, and continued you know, case studies and evidence that shows that that can be done in a way that's sustainable, right? And, and phased and, and smart and targeted. Um, uh, but I, I definitely think that they're needed if we're gonna achieve the goals that we're, we're trying to by, by 2030 and beyond. Brilliant, and I can see some nodding heads uh, around the virtual room. We're coming to the end of our session. Uh, so I'm afraid it's time to wrap up. Thank you so, so much uh, to our brilliant panel. Uh, to Yatunde for sharing uh, the great model that they've created um, for community payments, to Christopher for sharing what the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe have done uh, to collectively empower purchases in Zimbabwe, to you, Jones, uh, for sharing the incredible progress that you've made and being so honest and open with us uh, about the journey that you've been on and the role that consumer protection has played in that, and to you, Christine, uh, and Juan Carlos for your expertise. Um, and thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, this is not the end of our Clean Energy Conference. Uh, we've got uh, one more session and it's called Consumer Protection. Sorry, we're going, here we go. Consumer Policy, is it fit uh, for a clean energy future? Uh, and I'd recommend you all tune in for that. Um, it's a brilliant session. Uh, and we will look at how consumer policy needs to change at the national, but also the international level. And we've heard uh, a teaser from uh, Jenny on that already. I wanna give the last word to our consumer advocate on the panel, Christopher. Um, what have you learned uh, from today? Uh, and how is it gonna change your work going forward? And if Christopher is not able to connect Yatunde, Final word from you. You've talked about how you've inspired uh, young people in Nigeria to start their own projects. Um, have you been inspired by what you've heard today? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I've been inspired by um, what Christine um, said, how Zuma Energy is working, which is typically um, related to what we do in Nigeria. Um, and I've also taken the learnings from um, um, the discussion to see how I can use it to improve on how we are currently servicing, you know, our target audience in, in, in Nigeria. And um, this discussion further reiterates that the consumers are the most important stakeholders in, in this energy transition. And um, I think everybody should, should also leverage that and also think about that when we are you know, um, devising strategies or devising uh, um, solutions to um, further the bottom line. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ajunde. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, have a very happy World Consumer Rights Day week. Bye-bye.